Hey, before we get into it, I'm in England right now touring. I've got shows in England, Scotland, Ireland. I've got London on the 13th and 14th of August. One of those shows is sold out. We've got still some tickets left to the other show. Then we go to Bristol, August 15th. Then Birmingham on, on the 16th. Manchester on the 22nd. Uh, one of the Manchester shows is sold out. We added another one. Uh, Liverpool on the 23rd. Leeds on the 24th. Newcastle on the 27th. Then we go to Scotland. Glasgow on the 28th. Then we go to Ireland. Uh, Belfast on on the 30th and Dublin on the 31st. That's the tour. Loosebeers.com. Get your tickets. I'll see you there. I cannot wait. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 359 of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. I'm coming at you live from London at the London Podcast Studios. Uh, I was going to record in my hotel, but uh, upon immediately upon arrival, I realized that it was much more of a hostel than it was a hotel, all right? I may, I potentially may have fucked up when it comes to booking the accommodation. I may have made an error, all right? I thought I was staying in a hotel. Turns out it's more of a slum, okay? I'm staying in Whitechapel, which is the, uh, look, let's put it this way. It's the cheapest square you can buy on Monopoly, all right? And that's reflected in reality. Monopoly turns out very geographically, ac- demo- not, not demographically, what economically accurate, okay? The good suburbs are the expensive ones, the, the shitty ones are the cheap ones. And I've, I've been to a few different Monopoly squares and it makes sense. In fact, <laughs> some would say that I should be in a different place. It's maybe not the safest thing. Look, okay? There's been a lot of news about the, the the London riots. I haven't seen anything like that. That's not true. I that is that is actually the first thing that I saw as soon as I got off the train. All right, I got off the train and then uh, I'm walking to my accommodation. Gigantic rally, uh, full of flags that I did not recognize, and I was like, "What's going on here? This is popping off." Um, avoided it. Got home, Googled the flag. It was a a Bangladeshi protest. And I was like, oh man, what are the Bangladeshis upset about? And they're upset about police brutality in Bangladesh. It's their BLM, Bangladeshi Lives Matter. I don't know. I'm not culturally aware enough to understand it. But uh, but depending on what will sell me the most tickets, I either support or disavow it. (laughs) I'm not educated enough on the matter to comment, and I won't be educating myself. So I support or disavow it, whatever gets you in the door. Loosebeers.com. These shows are going to be fun, man. The other London riots or protests or whatever it is, is everyone's upset over immigration. Hey, I'm an immigrant. I'm here. I'm I'm, I'm, uh, contributing. I'm I'm not here trying to steal jobs. What's going on? I can't be here. All these EDL, English Defence League geezers don't want me in your country until they see the colour of me and they go, ah, you're all right, come on in, buddy. (laughs) No, but for real, it's been, uh, tensions are very obviously high where I am and London seems to be the least hit by it. Uh, There was one night, I think it was Thursday night, where I got messages from a bunch of people who live in London saying, hey, dude, don't go out tonight. There's going to be crazy protests. And I start reading into it, and there are all of these, like, telegram groups of people talking about burning down migrant centres. And where I'm staying, Whitechapel, it's like a migrant-heavy area. So I'm thinking, oh, fuck, I'm right in the middle of it. So uh, apparently three or 4,000 extra police officers were on the street and then nothing happened. Not a single protest. No, nothing seemingly happened, at least in, in, uh, in London, where I'm staying. But I know Ruben, a bunch of people just didn't turn up to his show because he's uh, performing further out. And that's where it seems to be the worst, is, uh, is other, other cities. Like, I think Dublin's got it pretty bad. I saw there was a big one in Bristol. Um, but so far, at least I haven't noticed anything in real life, but 
everyone that I talk to in London is a little bit freaked out about it. Like, it feels like everyone feels like it's going to pop off. But so far, nothing's happened. So that's, that's good. I have seen a lot of theft, though, which is not something that I expected, but I've seen a lot of it. It's, ha- it's happened heaps. And also, now that I'm on, on, in London, right, in the English internet, TikTok's worked out that I'm here, so it's just showing me a bunch of London tourism. So you should check out this tourist trap and buy a magnet for $3,500. No! That's not how you be a tourist. I tell you how you go to another country. You do no research, you plan nothing, you arrive and you wander. That's how you do it. That is, don't try and tell me that you need to have a fucking daily itinerary planned down to the hour. Fuck you. You're ruining your own trip. You're stressing yourself out. Arrive, wander. That's what you do. Maybe organize two things. All right? That's all that I did. Because let me tell you something. All of the things that you're supposed to see when you check out a country suck and they're boring, all right? The only reason I did all of it was to to do a video of me talking shit in front of all of them. I checked out Buckingham Palace, the cage where they keep those the, the, the pedophile that doesn't sweat locked up. I had a look at that. What else did I look at? I looked at, I looked at Big Ben. Uh, actually, Big Ben is the bell inside the clock tower. It's called Elizabeth Tower. You're a nerd. You're a nerd and you're boring. Colloquially known as Big Ben, that's what... If everyone on the fucking planet calls Big Ben the tower, that's the new name. Cool? Sorry. I'm not calling it Elizabeth Tower or whatever the fuck it is. All right? The tower is Big Ben. Uh, actually, the bell. Well, I'm not looking at the bell, am I? I'm looking at the tower. Everyone calls it Big Ben, so I'm going to call it Big Ben. Fuck you. All right? That's. We renamed your tower. I'm sorry, England, but it's been renamed. You're not a superpower anymore. The rest of the world looks at your tower and goes, oh, Big Ben. That's what it is. Okay? Anyway, saw Big Ben. What else did I say? That was a crowded shithole. Buckingham Palace was honestly disgusting. Will that get me deported? Just the idea that there's a there's a fucking giant palace with gates and everything in there is fucking gold. The obscene display of wealth garnered through violence is gross. In a country that is supposed to be democratic, it's quite foul. Am I, am I wrong? I think it's really, like, seeing it in real life really makes you go, oh, they're evil. <laughs> like, this, the history of this whole family was just... We're in charge because we'll kill you if you disagree. Stealing everything from fucking all over the world and then locking yourself behind gates and fucking your cousin. And I and everyone has to respect and bend the knee to that. Why? Because they're wearing a, a crown with the with the most expensive stolen blood diamond in the world. Whether it's the fucking Indian one they racked from a from a little child, or the the Cullinan which was give which was supposedly given to them by an African nation to celebrate their improving relations. Improve from what? I will enslave a little bit less of you. <laughs> I'll tell you what was amazing. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm having an amazing time. All of the tourist trap stuff I'm saying sucks. That's not how you enjoy a city. Do you know how I enjoy a place I've never gone to? I go to their supermarket and go, oh, look what their toothpaste is called. Because England, love ya. Loving London so far. Every single one of your products and business names is fucking stupid. 
Like in Australia, we'll call uh, a chocolate bar like, you know, we've got a Mars bar. We've got a Snickers. We've got a Boost bar. Every single chocolate I look at in London is like the Wobbly Jobbly and the Strizzy Whistler and the Jibbly Grobbler. Every pub is called the fucking, the grape and hoof and the bucket and spoon. The douche and the tampon. Like every, every single name is fucking ridiculous. Your station's names are absolutely ridiculous, but you'll have some normal ones. Like around my area, uh, there's a station called Oldgate Normal. But then you'll take you'll take it two stops in any direction, and all of a sudden the the woman's voice will come over the speakers and be like, "Welcome to Sunflower Padibbly, welcome to Whiplopbly Bibbidi Bob, welcome to Gong Show Palibbidi, welcome to the Palace of Dimbly Wimbly." Your country is silly. I love it. Even your supermarkets have goofy names. A Tesco. Greg's. What's the other one? There's another one. It's got a stupid name. It's whimsical. I love it. But all the tourist trap stuff, it, yeah. I mean, I guess you have to see it, but don't like, don't plan a day. I did, I did Buckingham. I did Big Ben. Uh... I saw fucking the Downing House, the Down Syndrome House, wherever they hold the politicians. Downing Street, that's right. Uh, and then somewhere else, Westminster Abbey. And like, that's a, an hour walk. Don't, like, you rush that. You know? One thing that I have really enjoyed... And I can't remember what I was talking about before I went onto this tangent. So if you were excited to hear whatever I was just speaking about before I went over here, that's the show. Welcome. One thing that I, that I saw, and again, didn't plan it. All right. I've been suffering with extreme jet lag. It's been horrific. I, I don't, for, for whatever reason, I didn't think it would be that bad because I didn't really suffer from jet lag when I went to New York, I, it wasn't that bad. I don't know why, but this one has really rocked me. Oh, I'll tell you why. Because I get to the fucking airport in Melbourne. My flight's at 12.30. I'm flying with Royal Brunei Airlines, which, yes, I didn't know that existed either. Okay, every single person I've said Royal Brunei Airlines has gone, is that real? And then I go, yeah, dude, it's run by the Sultanate of Brunei. You don't know the Sultanate of Brunei? That's my liege, my favorite royal family. This guy doesn't know who the Sultanate of Brunei, this guy doesn't know the Sultanate of Brunei. Loser. Tell you what, Buckingham Palace sucks. I would love to see the Sultan's lair or whatever he calls it. Anyway, love the Sultan, love the Sultanate of Brunei. Not a big fan of Royal Brunei Airlines because I get to the airport at 12.30 p.m., arrive, cancelled. I got to the, I got to, no, sorry, the flight was 12.30. I got to the airport at 8.30 because I'm organized. That's why. Because the, because when they say get there three hours beforehand, I fucking knew something was going to go wrong. So I got there early. Cancelled immediately. Fuck. So, I go up to the counter. Here's a funny thing about flying international, right? You have lots of different airlines and air hostesses, and every airline obviously hires in the country that their company exists. This sounds so obvious, but when you're in the moment, it's surprising. All the fucking people get off the cancelled flight, go to the desk. I go to ask for help. None of them speak English. I was like, oh, fuck, what do I do? And they don't know what to do either because they don't speak English. So they have to figure out a translator. And then they tell us the flights are cancelled. And then 
I sit in the fucking airport for four hours listening to people who have never traveled in their lives before try to yell their way into getting the plane to fly. It's like, bitch, if the flight is canceled, good, okay? They said it's canceled due to a mechanical issue, all right? Now, when I hear that, I th- I'm annoyed, but I'm also like, thank God that it got canceled because otherwise we would all have died on the flight, huh? That's why they cancel it. So, so when you have some fucking idiot who's never traveled in their life who's accustomed to bullying customer service people into crying at a fucking Coles, sorry, I'm in London, at a Tesco's in it. These people are like, oh, none of the air hostesses speak English? I'm sure some yelling will be able to fix this issue, fucking idiot. Anyway, I'm at the airport for four hours, but it's okay because they gave me a $20 voucher. Oh, good. It's fucking 9.30 in the morning. I've got a twenty dollar voucher. What will that? What will that get me? A crumb? And I can't go into the terminal because I got all my bags and stuff. So I got to eat the shit food. I got a grilled for breakfast. Oh, it made me want to get myself arrested at the airport. It made me want to say some sentences that would get me flight banned. I got a grilled for breakfast. Shoot me in the head. Worse than that, they're playing Barbie Girl. I'm a Barbie Girl. It's fucking 9.30 in the morning. My flight's been canceled. I'm not a Barbie Girl. I'm very upset. Four hours go by. Then they say, oh, we can't get you on a flight until 8.30 p.m. Fuck. 12 hours at the air. Mind you, the travel time is already like 30 hours. So let's just let's just add 10 to that. 40 hours. Woohoo! Yes. They go, the next flight's at 8.30, but don't worry, we'll put you in a hotel. I go, okay, good. A hotel. They put me in a hotel across the road from the airport. They go, just go there, they'll sort you out. I get there, I'm like, hi, my name's Lewis. And they go, who the fuck is that? I go, oh, my airline was canceled. They said, we don't know anything about that. The manager then calls the fucking airline comes back to me and goes, oh, none of them speak English. I said, I know. And he goes, I don't know why they sent you here. And I said, well, I'm, I, I smell like shit because I've been sitting in an airport eating grills, fuming, while I'm a Barbie girl gets blasted into my fucking ears. Eventually, I sit in the hotel of the fucking lobby for two hours. An entire canceled plane an entire canceled flight rocks up. For whatever reason, everyone else gets to go to their room before me. Like a hundred people and then I'm sitting in the fucking lobby going, I was here first. I get to go into my fucking room. I'm there for 40 minutes. And then I got to go back to the fucking airport. However, during this whole time, I'm trying to scam my way into a business class ticket because I'm like 12 hour delay, cancellation last minute, fuck me over with the hotel. Surely I'm getting an upgrade to business. Now, they put me on Qatar Airlines, an upgrade to business all the way to London. That's like a $30,000. That's like a $30,000 ticket. But you know me, I love a good verbal. And I love to fuck over conglomerates. If a, if a business makes a mistake, you have to do two things. First, you check if it's a small business. And if it's a small business, you forgive and you forget. You live and let live. We all make mistakes. We're all human. We've all been there. And it does no one any good to try and take advantage of situations Uh, and leave the other party worse off because it might be you who makes a mistake one day and you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that kind of behavior. 
However, if upon checking you realize the business that has made the mistake is actually a multinational conglomerate, you fucking take those cunts for everything they have. You take them for every single dollar, every single cent, every penny you can squeeze out of that business because they don't pay tax and this is how we tax them. All right? This is why they don't pay tax, so that when they make a mistake, you can rub them. So I'm hustling, you know? I'm at the desk going, I want a business class upgrade. I'm very upset. This is a huge delay. I'm a businessman. I'm traveling. This is costing me money. It's not costing me anything. But, you know, I'm on, I'm on the e-chat line looking up how to say, uh, Allah bless you. Because it's a Muslim country. I'm saying shukran, which is thank you in Arabic. I'm doing it all. Alhamdulillah, I want a fucking business class upgrade. Inshallah, I will sit in a business class seat. Unfortunately... Allah, peace be upon him, did not bless me with a business class flight. However, I was given an exit row seat. Maximum leg room. And I was sticking my legs out, tripping up people as they went to the shitter, man. I loved it. Anyway, I went with Qatar Airlines. So my original flight was, we were supposed to go to uh, Brunei, right? But instead we went to Doha, which is in, ah, uh, oh, no, I can't remember the country. Oh, Qatar, idiot. Dude, that's an airport. Those oil baron Muslim trillionaires, they know how to flex, dude. And it's not buy a Rolex. It's put a forest in an airport in a desert. That's, they had a forest in an airport in a desert. They had a forest in an airport in a desert. That's oil money. That's a fucking flex, dude. Do you know how much money I saw walking around that airport? In Melbourne Airport, we have a duty-free section. You know what's in there? Siggies. In Doha, they have a duty-free section. You know what's there? Bugattis. There's cunts going through that airport that are buying Bugattis on a whim. Oh, it's tax-free. I'll save $2 million. Meanwhile, we're like, oh, fucking cheap ziggies, bruh. I don't have to pay $57,000 a packet. So anyway, I eventually get to Doha and I'm walking around the airport and in Doha airport, they have smoking rooms, right? Which is just crazy. They got smoking rooms and I'm walking around and they're, they're behind like three doors. It's like an airlock to a spaceship. But honest to God, it wasn't working. Every time, I don't know what the fuck they're smoking in Doha. I don't know what type of thousand dollar cigar sticks those guys are inhaling. But every time I walked past a smoking room, didn't go in, walked past, doors shut. I started sneezing and coughing. And that's me standing three doors away from where the actual smokers are. I had in my mind to go in to check it out, but I knew that I would die. Like, I would walk past a door and start sneezing and coughing. I don't know what they're smoking there, but I don't recommend it. Get on that flight. Finally get to London. First thing I see is the Bangladeshi protest. My phone's almost dead. I'm trying to get to my hotel, what I think is a hotel. It's a hostel. I finally get in. I collapse. Since then, I have been waking up at 4 a.m. and going to sleep involuntarily at like 7 p.m. every single day. Every day. It's been like a week and I can't stop waking up at 4 a.m. By the time it hits 5 p.m., I start, like, my legs feel weak, my body. It's such a weird thing. I've never been this jet lag before. It's so weird for your entire body to know that it's nighttime, but you can see the sun. 
It's a very weird feeling. Today, though, I did wake up at 6. And last night, I went to bed at 10.30. So I feel like I'm, I'm just getting over it. And I feel okay now. Like, it's 11.30. I would start to be feeling quite sleepy now, but I'm all right. Um, oh, that's what I was saying. Theft. I've seen a lot of theft. Because I'm in the London algorithm, I'm getting recommended all this stuff about London. And one of the one of the main things I keep seeing is people on TikTok talking about phones getting stolen or their phones getting stolen or how to protect yourself from phone theft or filming someone's phone getting stolen. And it's super real, dude. You see people... So what they do is there's guys that will roll around on electric bikes, not e-bikes that you pay for, but their own electric bikes, all black. They're wearing balaclavas and helmets and glasses. So they're completely anonymous. They've got gloves with rubber on the palm and the fingers to make for extra grip strength when it comes to your phone. And what they'll do is they'll just drive, ride really slowly, down the road, and because it's electric, it's silent, and it can accelerate blindingly fast. And they'll just wait for anyone to pull their phone out. They'll come up behind them, snatch the phone, rock it off. You can't catch them. People, do, I've seen like six videos of people's phones getting stolen, and no one even attempts to run after them because they just know. And I've seen these guys on bikes, usually in pairs, just rolling around, all black, that you would have no chance at identifying them. And yeah, phones are getting stolen all the time. I was, and I've also seen theft in supermarkets. Like it seems like it's quite a big issue. I'm vlogging while I'm here, and I'm, I've my head's on a swivel, dude. I've got like a wrist strap that I'm wearing around my arms. It's a, it's a real thing here. Like when I, I heard about it, I was, oh yeah, theft, knife, crime, whatever. It's never as bad as what it is. Because New York, I heard so much bad stuff about New York and crime and theft and violence. And I really didn't see any of it. And I felt very, very safe. Here, I definitely feel safe. Like I don't think there's any threat of violence. But I absolutely feel very wary that I'm going to get robbed. Because I see these people riding around and it's not just where I'm staying Whitechapel it's like everywhere dude and every single person that I meet tells me don't pull your phone out in the street if you have to look at maps go into a store or if you really have to two hands keep it close to your chest so yeah that's real the theft stuff um anyway the one tourist thing that I did was amazing. Okay, you got to do this one. And I didn't really hear much about it either. And this is again, right? Me just on a whim wandering. Okay, I woke up and I thought, oh, I'm going to go to the, the museum. Look it up. You need to book tickets. They're free. They were sold out that day. Whatever. I booked them a few days in advance right then and then. I thought, oh, well, I'll just go for a wander. What's, I look, open up my map, my map, I go, oh, the London Bridge is nearby. I'll have a look, right? I'm going towards London Bridge, and then in the middle of the city, like the city, I come across a fucking castle. A castle. I feel like you haven't absorbed that properly. I'm in the middle of a city with trains and buses and cars and electricity and the internet and coffee shops. And I am looking at a castle with spires and walls and a fucking moat. A moat! A castle with a moat and a drawbridge and a portcullis and murder holes. And archery stations, like, I was just looking at a fucking 7-Eleven. Now I'm looking at a castle. How are these two things existing in the same geographical location, let alone the same fucking time period? I'm in Australia. We don't have anything old. 
We have no old things in my country. Okay? How am I looking at a fucking castle? So I'm like, well, I got to see this. I pay 30 pounds to get in. 60 bucks. Fuck. Whatever. And I find out, bro, it's the Tower of London and it's where the royals used to live back in King Henry's day. You know the guy that invented divorce? That dude. Or was that King James? Whatever. No, the King James invented divorce. Did he? One of them invented divorce. Oh no, King Henry just killed them. <laughs> That's right. I'm getting my kings confused. King Henry just, cho- just when he got when he got sick of a bitch, he chopped her head off. You're annoying. I want a new wife. Well, you can't have a new wife. You've married her. Yeah, well, she's doing treason. Oh, well, we'll have to kill her for that. Oh, it looks like I'm single. I need a new wife. Seems like it was the most dangerous job in the, in the land was being King Henry, Henry's wife. Like, if you, were, if you nagged him once, you'd be headless tomorrow. But anyway, Tower of London, right? The English kings, I don't know which one fucking actually built it. I know King Henry lived there, but this was built in the year 1000. Huh? A thousand years ago, and it's still standing, and I'm and I can go and see it, and I can bring my iPhone in. What the fuck? How does that make sense? I don't understand. If you are listening to this and you live in London, and you don't think that's crazy, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. You've been desensitized to it. There's a castle... And over the top of it is a satellite. Right? But not only is all of the, like, fucking buildings in there, right? There's a castle. There's a dungeon. The dungeon that was used, or the tower that was used to hold prisoners, there was graffiti scraped into the walls from prisoners that were held there Written in English that is so old, I could only understand half of it. Like you you would piece together the meaning of the sentence because you could kind of understand half of the words. Spellings different, words used different, order of words different, but it kind of made sense. And then they had a translation. They had graffiti from prisoners that was scratched into the walls when they were held there in like the 1500s and I'm looking at it and I got to take a photo of it and put it on my Instagram story. And they were in old English, German, Spanish. It was the the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. Fucking mind blowing that I and that exist at the same time. Right? The biggest problem I had that day was I bought a protein shake from Tesco's and it was yucky. That guy was in chains in a fucking tower because he held a belief about God that someone else didn't. That's wild. But not only, right, was this castle built in the year 1000, okay? So there was a moat and giant walls, and then inside the giant walls was another set of walls, and then inside that was like the castle where the royals used to live and where they keep the crown jewels. I'm like, oh my God, this is a thousand years old. And I'm walking around the streets, and I'm just picturing the people that used to walk these very same streets as me and what their lives would have been like and what their worries were and what their opinions were or or what their joyous moments were. And and I was just in awe of it the whole time. Like, dude, I felt like I was 
in fucking Skyrim. Like, that's what it felt like. But then, I come across this plaque, and it, and it goes, all of this stuff that you can see was built by England in around the year 1000. But the outer walls were built by the Roman Empire approximately in the year 200. Huh? 1800 fucking years ago, the Roman Empire built these walls and then the Roman Empire crumbled and then I think Dutch people built a village inside there and then they fell apart and then another civilization built another campsite or a little village in there and then they crumbled and then England in the year 1000 built theirs and it's still standing. 1800 years, those walls and that moat has been there and people in England are worried about their fucking Tesco's meal deal. There's a castle in your city and you're, you're, I don't know. That's the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen in my life. Is that, is that not crazy? I was standing where they used to chop off heads. Now, the biggest crime you can commit in England is a tweet. <laughs> Crazy. I don't know. It was just the most mind-blowing thing. My head is still spinning from it of like all of those people and all of those lives. and every, Like in one spot, right? One spot. And it was that this place was built by the Roman Empire. Then there were a couple of other civilizations within those walls. Then there was the, the English royals and all of the wars that they fought. Then there was World War I. Soldiers were trained in there. Then World War II, it was getting bombed in the Blitz. And now we're at now. And that thing has been there through all all of those historical moments and people have lived in there since the year 200, assuming probably even sooner than that because you wouldn't build those walls if you're the Roman Empire without having something there in the first place for a while. It's like, wow. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life and every person I talk to in London is like oh yeah that's the 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 tower of London it's a castle brother how can you walk past that and not be like holy everything I look at in this city I'm just like holy shit this is so old this is so beautifully made Like, I saw the most beautiful building I've ever seen. Like, my first day here. I was like, that's the most glorious building I've ever seen. Look at the spires on the roof. Look at the architecture. Look at what they've, how they've built this. This must be like some beautiful, glorious monument to God and the spirit of humanity. And, and, and this is just such a, a testament to what, we can achieve if we put our minds towards creating something beautiful. And it was a building and down the bottom it was a store and it, and it sold condoms and vapes. <laughs> you know? Whereas in Australia, our vape stores look like they should have a vape store in. It's like the ugliest building you've ever seen. It's it like it it's looks extremely flammable. It's gonna fall apart in five years. It was built by Chinese developers that are just trying to make money and 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 hope the roof collapses so that they can build another building and rip off the next generation of people who want to live there. 
Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Mr. Beast is in big trouble. Mr. Beast is in big trouble. The Mr. Beast empire is crumbling. Dude, I've been saying this for a long time, and I've always gotten insane pushback for it, but I've always believed this. Mr. Beast is helping people and doing charity because it gets him views. Mr. Beast does not want to be a good person. The good things that he does for people are to get views. It's a coincidence that the algorithm rewards his good deeds. If the algorithm rewarded throwing boiling hot water on homeless people, that is what Mr. Beast would be uploading. Mr. Beast is an inherently morally neutral character that only cares about views, and we're lucky that YouTube is uh, rewarding him for building homes for people in countries that it's cheap to build homes in because there's a lower standard of uh, building safety and requirements. You know? I built a thousand homes for people in a nation where it's legal to build homes with toothpicks instead of nails. <laughs> you know? We're very lucky that YouTube rewards Mr. Beast for doing good deeds. Okay? Because if evil, dark activities were rewarded by the YouTube algorithm, that guy would be taking all of the plastic that he removed from the ocean and putting it back in if it meant an extra 3% in click-through rate on his videos. You guys think that it looks a little bit creepy that he's doing that face in every single thumbnail, but if he could bring up the click-through rate by 0.3% by inserting an image of him strangling a dog, he would. Okay? I'm not saying that Mr. Beast is evil. I'm saying that he's not a good person either. He's doing everything for views. And it's a coincidence that when he does a good thing, it gets views. <laughs> so Mr. Beast is gone through so many dramas recently. First, the big drama was, ah, oh, his best friend is trans. And then all the right-wing people were like, he's probably some, some sex-addicted freak. And then everyone else was like, no, that's transphobic. And then Chris was like, well, actually... <laughs> Damn, this is like for trans people, like when uh, when there was that tunnel found underneath the synagogue for Jews, you know? Like it just wasn't the press that you guys needed right now, you know? With Israel and Palestine going going all across the world and with a lot of people looking at what Israel's doing as, as terrible and a lot of that perception being uh, un unjustly thrown at the everyday Jewish person, the last thing that uh, the, the reputation of Jewish people across the world needed was uh, video footage of, of a Jew crawling out of a sewer in New York City. It's just not good. And the same thing goes for the trans community, all right? The last thing you guys needed is arguably the most famous trans person in the world that isn't Caitlyn Jenner. <laughs> getting exposed for having a very inappropriate relationship with a minor. It's just not what you guys needed, you know? Because now, you know, the big two trans people, you've got a murderer and, and a sex freak. It's not good. Where's a normal trans person when you need one? So Mr. Beast is in hot water because... Chris or Ava, or whatever their name is, is a bit of a sex freak. And apparently it was an open secret at Mr. Beast. And I can see that uh, being true. Uh, and it looks like that it has been proven to be true as well. Because a former Mr. Beast employee has come out and uh, said that everyone knew 
that there were problems with Chris. Everyone knew that there was questionable stuff happening and everyone was doing their best to keep it hush-hush. And yeah, I guess this goes back to what's the worst, what, what would have been the worst look for, for Mr. Beast? Because if he, if he fired Chris when all of the transphobes were telling him to, he would have looked very transphobic. Because they said, oh, you got to get rid of the trans person because they're a little freak and you're trying to corrupt kids and turn them trans, which I disagree with. But now he's looking like a sex pest supporter. It's not a good look. Even worse than the Chris Tyson thing is just now... Another former employee of Mr. Beast has revealed that one of the earlier Mr. Beast employees that was around for a very long time and in a few videos was a convicted sex offender. And Jimmy was told this by the convicted sex offender before they were hired. And they went, welcome aboard. <laughs> what? What are you doing? What is wrong with YouTubers? That's fucking crazy. I want to create the biggest YouTube channel in the world. And the way I'm going to do that is by targeting my content to children. Uh, the first person I'm going to need to hire is a pedophile. <laughs> Dude, YouTubers are just, they're not human beings. They don't live on Earth. And I always knew that there was something weird about Mr. Beast because he exported his personality. Not so, Sorry, he outsourced personality. Like, he was at the forefront of the videos for a while, but even he was like, my personality is not good enough to get the type of views that this channel needs. So he outsourced personality. And who did he outsource it to? Pedophiles. <laughs> hey, you guys, you guys are good at getting children interested in you. Come welcome aboard. Be the face of my YouTube channel. Oh my God. And this conv convicted sex offender, right? They had him masked up in the video. So they had to have known that they can't show this guy's face in the videos. Otherwise, why would he be wearing a mask? The, what was the thinking that was going on before they filmed those videos? Oh, uh, I really need an extra person in, in my video. But I don't really want people to know that I've hired a convicted sex offender. So I'll just put him in a mask. No, brother. The answer is don't hire the convicted sex offender. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, turns out that um, one of my employees is a pedophile, but don't worry. We fixed the problem by, by making him wear a mask. <laughs> Dude, YouTube's awesome. Just the, the, the lack of real world experience and the, the lack of understanding into how like a normal human being's brain works will never cease to astound me when it comes to YouTubers of like, oh yeah, I'm like obviously like, you know, a, a pedophile's bad, but if we put like a mask on them, it's fine. And people won't notice. Like, I like, what is wrong with you? And and I know exactly why that was done. Because look, I'm not saying that I'm not a YouTuber. I know, and I understand how these people work. Right? Is is YouTubers are so inherently lazy, and they just don't want to engage with any sort of paperwork or thinking or doing things legally. That like. The effort that it would have taken for him to find another person that wasn't a pedophile was just 
ah, whatever. I'll just have the pedo. <laughs> What the fuck? So now this is all going on. Right before Mr. Beast's Amazon Prime TV series is supposed to be made and supposed to be released. Which, by the way, while that was being filmed, women were being refused access to tampons and pads. People were having fucking seizures on set because they weren't allowed to have their medicine. And no one was being fed food this is what happens when you give a youtuber the opportunity to do a real job like creating a television show they go oh rules regulations and keeping people safe nah no thank you mr beast refused to hire union workers because it would be too expensive and then as a result of that, almost killed a bunch of contestants <laughs> because no one was there to be like, oh, Jimmy, I don't think that we can let people not eat food for 72 hours, uh, you know? I think someone might die. Like, yeah, there's a reason why union workers are more expensive. It's because they say things like, oh, I don't want to do that because it would be really dangerous and I might die. I will only do it if I can wear this safety equipment. <laughs> you know? Oh, the union guys are so expensive. Yeah, because you got to feed them, brother. You have to feed them food. Oh, these bloody unions. Apparently, women on their period want access to feminine hygiene products. The only one that gets feminine hygiene products in my company is Chris. <laughs> Dude. The Mr. Beast company is... Just seems like, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a YouTuber's company. And every single YouTuber's business on earth is in fucking shambles. Because everything is just done the quick and easy way. And none of the paperwork is read or considered. Because at the end of the day, it's not run by a CEO. It's not run by a businessman. It's run by an autistic 17-year-old that is 25. But they never had to stop being 17 because they started getting views when they were 17 and they, then they just never had to have a job. So even though they're 25, they're still 17 and that's why they talk to 15-year-olds. I can't wait to see what happens next. What else has been going on with, with the Mr. B scandal? Oh, man. I just think it's, it's so awesome. Do you think he still wants to be president? <laughs> I don't think so. I love that all of this stuff happened. He was like, I think I would like to be president. And then... All of a sudden, he's friends with six pedophiles and he's starving people in a basement and he's, and he's letting female contestants free bleed onto the floor while they're doing a fucking isolation challenge. You know? I don't think you can be president, dude. All right? Although, maybe he could because it seems like from... What a lot of these contestants are saying and former employees are saying and former members of challenge videos. Maybe he would make a great president. For example, I was watching this video of a guy who was a former employee. He did a, an isolation challenge where he had to stay in a room for a bunch of days alone. And they didn't turn the lights off the entire time so that he could sleep. That's a war crime. So maybe Mr. Beast would actually make a good president. Maybe that's what Mr. Beast is training for. He's just setting up all of these experiments 
torturing poor people who really want something from them so that he can run Guantanamo Bay one day. Do you think that's it? That must be it. That's what Mr. Beast is doing. He's trying, to, he's trying to work out the best way to manipulate poor people, which is the best way to become president, if you really think about it. If you can whip up a bunch of poor people into a desperate frenzy, you become the leader. That's how your boy Hitty got into office. Hey, old Adolf. You know? You know, you know about eight months ago, all those insane red pill Twitter users going, oh, Mr. Beast is the Antichrist. He's the mark of the beast. They sound a lot less crazy today. I'm not saying that they're definitely correct. It's just they sound a little bit less crazy, you know? I wonder what happens now. Do you think he ever makes a, like a real statement? Because so far, he fired Chris with a public statement and he sent like an email around to his team going, oh, we're going to hire more people to make the company better to work for. But I do wonder if this has any material impact on Mr. Beast because he's such a global force and a global brand that... I don't know. Does do non English speaking countries care about this stuff at all? Maybe not. Obviously, America seems to care a bit, and and I'm talking about it. But I do wonder if this has any impact on him in like two months. Like we live in a world where Donald Trump got shot in the head, and no one cares about that anymore. Like that was like, oh yeah, that was a a viral video to to people. Like, no one cares about that at all. <laughs> so, maybe this all just blows over. It'll be interesting to watch. I just I just know that the ultimate form of Mr. Beast is Jimmy just not being in the videos at all anymore. Like, if he, if he can figure out a way to remove himself from the videos and still get the same amount of views, if not more, he will 100% do that. Like, there's a reason why the Mr. Beast logo is a logo and not his face. Like, every other YouTuber's logo is essentially their face. I think there's a reason why Mr. Beast is a beast, because he doesn't want to be Mr. Beast. He wants Mr. Beast to be the company, and whoever he puts in front of you, that's the Mr. Beast video. And if he can step back from it, I reckon that's the ideal thing. So maybe this is the catalyst to that. Who knows? I mean, so far, Jimmy himself hasn't personally done these things. It seems to be the result of, like, poorly thought out ideas resulting in harm and badly managed stuff and then actual acts committed by employees and friends. No one's got a story of like Mr. Beast the person did this to me with his hands and words like that hasn't happened yet but I don't know hopefully it doesn't hopefully he is the saint that he presents himself to be but it will be very interesting to watch what happens I think we're going to leave it there, guys. That's about an hour. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for supporting the show on Patreon. We're going to continue uh, over on Patreon. I've booked this studio for... Oh, okay. I think what the Patreon episode's going to be is it, it is going to be me in the hostel. So <laughs> if that's something that you're looking forward to, a, little, a more relaxed, less yelly, um, slightly self-conscious recorded in a terrible, dark place, that's going to be on Patreon for you. All right, that's it. I'll see you in... All right, that's it. I'll see you at the shows.
All right, that's it. We're going to continue on Patreon. The Patreon episode is up right now. Thank you very much for listening and supporting the show. I want to see you on tour, loosebeers.com. I'm going all over this beautiful country and Scotland and Ireland, loosebeers.com, for all the dates, for all the cities. I'm so excited for these shows. I cannot fucking wait. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you on Patreon, and I'll see you at the shows. Have a shit one. Bye.